Very excited to have a fireside chat here with uh, Mark Sear. Mark, you're the director of data integration, AI, machine learning and analytics at uh, Maersk. And Maersk is one of the largest shipping companies in the world, uh, shipping line and logistic companies in the world, based out of Copenhagen, but subsidiaries and offices across 130 company, uh, countries with about 83,000 employees worldwide. Um, we know that we always think about logistics and shipping as something just working harmoniously, transparently in the background. But in the recent past, given all of the supply chain pressures that have happened with the pandemic and beyond, and even that ship getting stuck in the Suez Canal, I think a lot more people are paying attention to this industry as well. So I'm super excited to have you here, Mark, to hear more about yourself, you as the leader of data teams, and about what Maersk is doing with data analytics. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure. Just uh, You've just illustrated the perils of Wikipedia. Maersk is not just one of the largest shipping companies in the world, but we're also actually one of the largest logistics companies in the world. We have our own airline. Uh, we've got hundreds of warehouses globally. We're expanding massively. So we're there. And, and of course, we are a leader in decarbonation. We've uh, got a pledge to be carbon carbon neutral way before just about anybody else. So it's a fantastic company to work at. I often say to my kids, we don't just deliver stuff. We're doing something to help the planet. It's a bigger mission than just delivering things. So it's a pleasure to be here. That's great, Mark. Before we get into Maersk, we'd love to learn about you. So you have an amazing background and uh, you know accumulation of all of these different experiences. Um, would you help the audience understand you know, some of your interests and how you got to be in the role that you currently are at? And you know, what is your role comprised of inside of Maersk? Um, well, it's a long story. I'm an old guy, so I'm just like a couple of years over 60 now, which is, uh, which you could say you don't look it, but don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> you don't look it at so, all. <laughs> I'm of a generation that didn't, not many of us went to university. So let me start there. So I left school at 18, uh, did a bit of time in the basic military before going to uh, what you would, I suppose, fundamentally a crypto analyst school. They they would de detect how smart you were, whether you had a particular uh, thing for patterns, and they, they sent me there. Did that. And then uh, since then, I've worked in banking, in trading in particular. Uh, I ran a big trading group for a major bank, which was great fun. So we were using data all the time to look for both not just arbitrage, but other things. Fundamentally, my life has been about data. Right. Um, even as a kid, my dad had a very small business and because he didn't know anything about computers, I would do the computing for him and work out the miles per gallon that his trucks were getting and what the trading <laughs> was and things sure. like that. So data has been part of my life and I love everything about data uh, and, and what it can do for people, companies, everything. Yeah, that's it, data. That's great, Mark. Uh, obviously, this is a conference about a data team, so it's, it's great to hear from the data guy who's been doing it for a really long time. So Mark, to begin, Maersk, as you said, one of the largest shipping and logistics companies in the world. How has data transformed your company? Well, I think that's, that's just a great question. How has it transformed and how will it transform? Yes. I, I think that for the first time in the last couple of years, and I've been very lucky, I've only been with the company three years, but I joined uh, under the, uh, shortly after I joined, we had a new tech leader, a gentleman called Navneet Kapoor. Um, the guy is a visionary. If you imagine shipping was seen for many years as a bit of a backwater, really. Um, mm -hmm. You move containers from one country to another country on ships. That was kind of it. Navneet has changed the game for us all and made people realize that data is pervasive in logistics. It's mm -hmm. literally everywhere. If you think about our biggest ship for ship class, for example, is called an E-class. Mm. That can take over 18,000 shipping containers on one journey from China to Europe. 18,000. Oh, wow. Think about that. So that's absolutely huge. Now, to put that into context, in one journey, one of those ships will move more goods than was moved in the entire 19th century between continents one journey 
And we've got six of them and they're going backwards and forwards all the time. <laughs> so the data has risen exponentially and what you can do with it, we are now just starting to get to grips with. That's what's so exciting. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have companies that do want to know how much carbon is being produced as part of their product. We have things like that. We also have an incredibly, incredibly diverse set of products. To give you an example, I worked on a project uh, about 18 months ago where we worked out working in, in, in tandem with a couple of um, uh, nature organizations that if a ship hits a whale at 12 knots and above, that whale will largely die. If you mm. hit it at 12 not, below 12 knots, it will live. It's a bit like hitting an adult at 30 miles an hour versus 20. Mm -hmm. and we, the company put some money in so we could use the data for where the whales were to slow the ships down. So oh, this wow. is an example of where this company doesn't just think about what can we do to make money. This is a company that thinks about how can we use data to better the company, make us more profitable, and at the same time, put back into the planet that gave us the ability to have this right. business. For Let's me, not forget that we're human. Most important. Yeah, it's super exciting, right? You can make all the money in the world. If you trash the planet, there's not a lot left to enjoy as part of it. <laughs> and I love that about this company. So absolutely. Something. And I'm guessing with the pandemic and post-pandemic, um, and all of the other data sets that you guys are, are you know gathering anyways from sensors or from the shipping lines or from you know all the efficiencies, right? With all the proliferation of all this data inside your organization, like what challenges has your team or this Maersk data team faced? Well, my, my team is in the enterprise architecture team. We therefore deal with all the other teams that are dealing with data. And I think we got the same challenges as everybody. We've got, is the, is the data quality right? Do we know where that data comes from? Are we mm. processing it efficiently? Do we have the right ideas to work on the right insights to get value out of that data? I think they're common industry things. And as with everything, it's a learning process, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, one, one man's high quality data is another woman's low quality data. Mm -hmm. And depending on who you are and what you want to do with that data, people have to understand how, how that quality affects other people downstream. And of course, because we've had, you're quite right, we did have a pandemic. And through the in the pandemic, shipping rates went a little bit nuts and they're, they're normalizing now. But of course, if you think about introducing predictive algorithms where the price is going vertically, an algorithm may not know mm -hmm. that there's a pandemic on it, just sees price. Mm -hmm. So I think what we, we find is challenging, same as everybody else is, how do you put that human edge around data? Very challenging. How do you build really high-performing teams? How do you get teams to truly work together and develop that esprit de corps? Those right. are, there's a lot of human problems that go alongside the data problems. Yeah. Mark, give us a sense of your size uh, in terms of teams, applications, whatever would help us understand wow. what you guys were, where you guys Jesus. are, and where you guys headed. Uh, three years ago when I joined, there were 1,900 people in tech. We've mm -hmm. now got nearly 6,000. Uh, we had a huge amount of outsourcing. Now we're insourcing. We're moving to an open source first in-house event-based uh, company. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've been very acquisitive. We've bought some logistics companies. So we've, we, we've gone on the end-to-end -end journey now with a logistics integrator of choice globally. We've got our own airline. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about a lot of things that, that play together. Uh, my team is a relatively tiny team. We've got about 12, but we liaise with, uh, for example, our global data and analytics team has got 600 people in it. Mm -hmm. We're then organized into platforms, which are vertically problem solving, but fully horizontally integrated, passing events between them. And each one of sure. those has their own data team in it as well. So overall, yeah. uh, I would guess we've got 3,000 people working directly with data in IT. Yeah. And then, of course, many thousands more. Wow. Out, in, out in the organization so it's a big organization super exciting I should say now i'm going to get a quick commercial in if you're watching this and you are a top data talent please do hit me up with your resume <laughs> there's a couple of thousand people watching this live so you'll definitely hey there you go man so listen as long as they're quality i don't care <laughs> from mark he's a great boss as well 
So when you think about the maturity curve of data operations, uh, when do you think Maersk is at, and what stands in your way to be fully mature? Okay, so let, let's let's let, let's analyze that. I I think the the biggest problem in any sort of maturity curve is not defining the curve. It's not producing a pyramid to say we're here and a dial to say, well, you rank as a one, you want to rank as sure. a five. The biggest problem to me is the people that actually formulate that curve. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone's got a staff turnover and everyone uh, or the majority of people know that they're part of a team. But the question is, how do you get that team to work with other teams and how do you disseminate that knowledge and get that group think of what is best practice for data ops? What is best practice for right. dealing with these problems? It's always um, a spectrum on the talent side, isn't it? Everybody it's a spectrum on the talent success, side. Yeah. There's, a, there's a high turnover because certainly yes. in the last 12 to 18 months, salaries have been going crazy. So you've had crazy turnover rates in some areas, sure. not so much in other areas. So, so the human side of this is one part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the human side to like how do you keep them engaged etc it's how do you share that knowledge and how do you get get that exponential learning organization going um mm -hmm. and perhaps when we when we get into what how we've arrived at tools like unravel um i'll explain to you what my theory is on that but it's kind of a almost a uh, swarm learning that you yeah. need to hear, like a an ant style learning of how to solve problems and yep. that's the hardest thing is getting everybody in that boat swimming in the same direction before you can apply best practice because everybody says this is best practice mm -hmm. sure but if if it was as simple as looking at a Gartner or whoever thing and saying oh there are the five lines we need to do everybody would do it there'd be no need for anybody to innovate because we mm -hmm. could all human beings aren't very good at following rules right yeah, yeah. So what kind of shifts and changes did you have to make in your big data operations and tools that you had to put into place for getting that maturity to uh, where you expect it to be? Um, I think the first thing we've got to do, we've got to get people thinking slightly shorter time frame. So everybody talks about agile, agile, agile. Right. Um, agile means different things to different people. We We had some people who thought that agile was well, you're going to get a fresh data set at the end of the day. So what the heck are you complaining about? When I started 15 years ago, you got it weekly. Mm -hmm. That's not agile. <laughs> um, equally, sure. you've got people who say, I need real-time data. Well, do you really need real-time data if you're actually dealing with an expense account? You right. probably don't. Okay. Right. So the first thing we've got to do is level set expectations of our users and then we've got to dovetail what we can deliver into those. You've got to be business focused. You've mm -hmm. got to bring value. Um, and, and that's that's a journey. It's a journey for it's a journey for the business users. It's sure. a journey for our users. It's about learning. So that's what we're doing. It's it's taking time. Yeah, it's it's taking time, but it's a, it's like a snowball. It is rolling and it is getting bigger and it is getting better yeah. and it is getting faster. Yeah. And then when you think about the tools, Mark, are there any that you had to put into place to accelerate this? Uh, and we've got, we're, we've probably got one of everything to start and now we're shrinking. Um, if I take, am I allowed to talk about Unravel? Or is that, or is this like a... Sure. So I'll talk, I'll talk as about much as you would. Unravel for a few seconds. Um, so... If you think about what we've got, let's say we've got 3,000 uh, people, primarily relatively young, inexperienced uh, people, churning out Spark code, let's say Spark Databricks code. Mm -hmm. And they all sit writing it. And of course, if you, if you are in a normal environment, you can ask the person next to you, how would you do this? You ask the person over there, how would you do this? We've had 3,000 engineers working from home for two years. Right. You've, even now... They don't want to come into the office per se, because it's kind of it's kind of inconvenient. Number one, because you might be journeying in an hour in and an hour home, and also it's not actually truly as productive. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you harvest that group knowledge, and how do people learn? So for us, we put Unravel in to look at and analyze every single line of code we write and come up with those micro suggestions and indeed macro suggestions that you would miss. And believe me, we've been through everything like 
code walkthroughs, code dives, all those things. They're all standard practice. If you've got 2,000 people and they write, let's say, 10 lines of code a day each, 20,000 lines of code, you are never going to walk through all of that code. You are never going to be able to set level set expectations. And this is key to me, be able to go back to an individual data engineer and say, hey, dude, listen, about these couple of lines of code, did you realize if you did it like this, you could be 10 times as efficient? And, and it's about giving that feedback in a way that allows them to learn themselves. And that's what I kind of love about Unravel is you can get the feedback, but it's not like when you get that feedback, nobody says, come into my office, let's have a chat about these mm-hmm. lines of code. You go into your private workspace. It gives you the suggestions. You deal with the suggestions. You learn. You move on. You don't make the mistakes again. Um, and they may not even be mistakes. Um, they might just be things you didn't know about. Right. And so because Unravel takes data from lots of other organizations as well, as I see it, we're in effect harvesting the benefits of hundreds of thousands of coders globally, of data engineers globally, and we're gaining the insights that we couldn't possibly gain by That's being right. even the best at self-analysis on the planet. You couldn't do it without that. And that, to me, is, is the advantage of it. It's like that swarm mentality. If you've ever, anybody watching this, have a look at swarm AI, which mm-hmm. is used um, to, to predict. You can use it to predict events. It's like if you take a soccer game, and I've worked in gambling, um, if you if you take a soccer match and you take a hundred people, um, I'll call it soccer, even though the real name for it is football. You American? It's football. football. I agree too. It's football, so we're going to call it football. Association football to give it its full name. If you ask a hundred football fans to predict a score, you'll you'll get a curve, and you, mm-hmm. you you generally from that predictor get the a good result, way more accurate than asking ten so called experts. Mm-hmm. Such is with code, and that's what we're finding with Unravel is that sometimes it's the little nuances that just pop up that are giving us benefits. So it's pivotal to how we're going to get benefits out over the longer term of what we're doing. That's great. And we always see a spectrum of skills inside an organization. So, you know, our mission is trying to level the playing field. So anybody, even a business user can log in without knowing the internals of all of these complex data technologies. Uh, so it's great to hear the way uh, Merck is actually using it. Um, we spoke a little bit about making these changes. Uh, would love to double click on some of these hurdles, right? Because you said it is a journey uh, yeah. to get to people to this mature or you know fast moving data operations, if you may, or a more agile data operations, if you may. Um, if you can double click for a second, like what has been the biggest hurdle? Is it the mindset? Is it managing the feedback loop? Is it changing the practices? Is it, uh, you know, getting new types of people on board? Like what has been the biggest hurdle? Uh, in tick, tick, tick all of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, I think yeah, so, so let me give, give you an example. I, there's several conversations. I, I've had conversations with people that have said to me, I've been doing this 25 years. There's nothing, I, I've been doing it 25 years. Yeah. That, that, that presupposes that 25 years of knowledge and experience is better than 10 minutes with a tool that's got 100,000 years of learning right. over a 12-month period. Um, so there's, there's that. I, I classify that as the ego problem. Sometimes people need their ego brushing. Sometimes they need their ego crushing. Mm-hmm. It's about looking the person in the eye, working out what's the best strategy of dealing with them and saying to them, look, get on board, you know. This isn't about saying you're garbage or anything else. This is about saying to you, learn and keep mentoring other people as you learn. Then yeah. remember another person said to me, oh, my God, I've seen what this tool can do. Is AI going to take my job? And I said to them, no, AI isn't going to take your job. But if you're not careful, somebody, a human being that is using AI will mm-hmm. take you. And that doesn't apply to mess. That applies just in general to the world. Right. You, you cannot be a Luddite. You cannot fight progress. And as we've seen with chat GPT and things like that recently, the power of the mass, the power of having hundreds and thousands and millions of nodes analyzing stuff is precisely what will bring, will bring that. As for example, um, my son, who's 23, smart kid. He, well, so he tells me smart kid, <laughs> good, uni- good university, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, he said to me, oh, Tesla, they make amazing cars. And I said to him, Tesla isn't even a car company. Tesla is a data company that right. happens to build a fairly average electric car. Absolutely. And that's it. It's all about data. And I keep saying to my data engineers, all you to, to be the best version of you at work and even outside work, keep picking up data about mm-hmm. everything, about your life, about your girlfriend, the way she feels, about your boyfriend, the way he feels, about your wife, your mother. Everything is data. And um, that's, that's the mindset. And the biggest thing for me, the biggest issue has been getting everybody to think and recognize how vital data is yeah. in their life and to be open to change. And we all know throughout, go through the cycle of humanity, um, a lack of openness to change is what's held humanity back. In That's it. Areas. I seek to break that as well. I love that, Mark. Switching gears, we spoke a little bit about developer productivity. We spoke about agility, data operations. Merck obviously runs, like you were explaining, a lot of their data operations on the cloud. Yeah. And as we see a lot of organizations, when they start to get bigger and bigger and bigger in use case on the cloud, cost becomes a front and center or a first class citizen conversation to have. Shed some light on that for us, right? Like, what, what is that maturity inside of Maersk or how do you think about managing costs and budgets and forecasts on the cloud? And what's the consequence of not doing that correctly? Well, there are some things that I can't discuss because they're obviously the kind of internal, but I think let's say I speak to a lot of people in a lot of companies and there seem to be some themes that run yeah. every, which is, there's a rush towards certain technologies and people, they, they test it out on something tiny and say, hey, isn't this amazing? Look how productive I am. Mm-hmm. Then they get into production and somebody else says, that's really amazing. You were very productive, but have you seen what comes out the other end? It's a mm-hmm. cost of a bazillion dollars an hour to run it. Mm-hmm. Then you've got this sort of, uh, I think Steve, they called it the uh, Steve Jobs reality distortion field. Where, where both sets of people go into this sort of right. weird thing of, well, I'm producing value because I'm de- generating code and isn't it amazing? And the other side is saying, yeah, but we, the, the physically the company is going to spend all its money on the cloud. We won't be able to do any other business. Yeah. So um, we're now getting to a stage where we have some really nice cost control uh, mechanisms coming in. For me, it's all in the audit, right? And, and crucial to this is, do it up front. Do it in your dev environment. Don't go into production, get a giant mm. bill, and then say, how do I cut that bill? Which is, again, where we've, we've put Unravel now right in the front of our development environment. So nothing mm. even goes into production unless we know it's going to work at the right cost price. Okay, Because otherwise, you've just invented the world's best mechanism for closing the stable door after the cost force has bolted right right and that's always a pain because post giant bill uh examinations are really Mm -hmm. painful it's a bit bit like medicine i don't know if you know but in china you only pay a doctor when you are well as soon as you're sick you stop paying bills and they have to take care of you right so that to me is how we need to look at cost do it i love that love that do it up front keep those keep people well don't ever end up with a cost problem. So yeah. that's, again, part of the mindset. Get your data early. Deal with it quickly. Yeah. Uh, and those are the, that's the level of maturity we're getting to now. It's taking time to get there. We're not the only people. I know it's, it, it's everywhere. But I would say to anybody, um, I was going to say lucky enough to be watching this, but that's a little bit cocky, isn't it? Um, anybody watching this, whatever you do, get, get in there early. Get your, get your best practice in as early as possible. Go live with fully costed jobs. Don't mm-hmm. go live, work out what the job cost is, and then go, how the hell do I cut it? Yeah. Go live with fully costed jobs and, and, and work out, well, if it costs this much in dev test, what's it going to cost in prod? Then check it as soon as it goes live and say, yeah, okay, the delta's right, game on. That's it. So measure twice, cut once, and then you're almost shifting left. So you're yeah, leaving like it for the data engineers to go and figure this out. So there's a practice that's emerging called FinOps. Um, yeah. which is really a lot of these different groups of teams getting together to exactly solve this problem of understand what the cost is, optimize what the cost is, and then govern what the cost is as well. So who within your team does what? I'm, I'm sure the audience would love to hear that a little bit. 
pretty much everybody will do everything. Every individual data engineer, man, woman, um, child, whatever, will be, we're not using child labor, incidentally. Yeah, let's a, clarify that one for the audience. That's a joke. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> but, um, ev every person will take it on themselves to do that because yeah. it, ultimately I have, a, I have a wider belief that every human being wants to do the right thing, given everything else being equal. They want mm -hmm. to do the right thing. So I will say to the people that I speak to as data engineers, as new data engineers, I will say to them, we will empower you to create the best systems in the world. But only you can empower yourself to make them the most efficient systems in the world. Interesting. And, and, and by giving it to them and saying, this is a matter of personal pride, guys. At the end of the day, do I... Am I going to look at every line of your code and say, oh, you wouldn't have got away with that in my day? Of, of yeah. course not. You know, I, when I started in IT, this is how depressingly sad it is. We had 16K of main memory on the main computer for a bank and an IBM mainframe. And you had to write out a form if you wanted 1K of disk. So I was in a similar program in those days. Now I've got a phone with <laughs> God knows how much RAM on it. Right. So, um, and anybody can spin up a cloud environment. Absolutely. Okay. I can push the button, spin up whatever I want. Right. And, but I think the way to deal with this problem is to, again, push it left. Don't have somebody charging in from finance, waving a giant bill saying, guys, yep. you're costing fortune. Say to people, let's just keep that finance dude or lady out of the picture. Take it on yourself. Show a bit of pride. Develop a spree to core, uh, esprit de core, and let's do it together. Love it. Mark, last question. This is a fun one, and I know you're definitely going to have some fun answer over here. So what are your predictions for this data industry for this year and beyond? What are we going to see? Um, wow. That's what do I think? The Since data, you got such a pulse on the overall industry and market. The, the, so, so to me, the, the, the data industry, obviously, it will continue to grow. I, I don't believe that technology at, in many levels I'll give you over a couple of years. Technology in many levels, we're actually a fashion industry. If the fashion is to outsource, mm -hmm. everybody outsource. If the fashion is to insource, everybody's women's skirts go up, fashion changes, they come down. Guys wear flared trousers, guys wears, wear narrow trousers, and every nobody wants to be out of fashion. What mm -hmm. I think is going to happen is data is going to continue to scale. Quantum computing will take off within a few years. And um, what's going to happen is your CEO is going to say, why have I got my data in the cloud and in really expensive data centers when someone has just said that I can put the whole of our organization on this and keep it in the top drawer of my desk? Mm -hmm. And you, you, you will have petabyte, zettabyte scale mm -hmm. in something that can fit in a shoebox. And at that point, it will change everything. I will probably either be uh, dead or, or at least hopefully retired and doing something by then. But I think it is for, for those people that are new to this industry, this is an industry that's going to go to get to go, going to go forever. I personally hope I get to have an implant in my head at some point from Elon. <laughs> I will be going for, I, I'm only going to go for like version two. I'm not going for version one. <laughs> Um, and hopefully, one. yeah, you don't never want to go for B1. Exactly, absolutely yeah. right. But, yeah. but it, you guys, ladies, everybody watching this, you're in the most exciting part, not just of technology, of humanity itself. I really believe that of humanity itself, you can make a difference that very few people on the planet get to make. And on that note, I think you know, the big theme that we have going on this year is we strongly feel that data teams are running the world and will continue to run the world. Mark, thank you so much for sharing this uh, exciting insights. And it's always fun having you. Thanks for making the time. Complete pleasure.